is on now too. Okay. Could someone on Zoom just say something really quick just so it could switch to the video mode? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Now we can. can you hear me? Yep. Yes. All right, I'm going to call this meeting to order at 6.03 p.m. I'd like to announce that this meeting is being recorded. May I have a roll call? Director Aguilar? Here. Topwolf? Here. Brad? Here. Freeman? Here. Craig? Here. Charles? Here. Director Deschler is absent today. Thank you. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge the Chumash people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to the Chumash elders, past, present, and future who call this place, Anascoyo, the land that Isla Vista sits upon, their home. We are proud to continue their tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Chumash community for their stewardship and support, and we look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. Now, I'd like to move, now I would like to move on to the consent agenda. I'll move approval of the consent agenda. We'll second. Okay, we have the motion by Toplet and the second by Brandt. Is there any discussion on this motion? See none. Is there any public comment on this motion? See none. Uh, may I please have a vote on this motion? I'm going to do everything by roll call today for Zoom. Uh, Dr. Schultz? Hi. Craig? Yes. Freeman? Yes. Topliff? Yes. Brent? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Now I'd like to move on to the public comment period. At this time, any member of the public may speak on matters within the subject matter jurisdiction of the Board of Directors that are not on the agenda. The Board will not take action on any item not on the agenda except as provided by law. Is there any public comment at this time? I see no public comment, so I will move on to our discussion and action items. Uh, we'll begin with item 4.2, the Community Engagement Annual Report. Okay, well, I'll turn it over to Sydney. Welcome back, Sydney. It's the first uh, board meeting that she's back at. So yeah, thanks back. for being Thank back. You. And Maya is going to present as well, who did an amazing job filling in for Sydney for how many months was it? Eight months? Yep. Eight months. Eight so, months. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, they're going to both present this report. So you can take, you can just put up these two yeah. seats and uh, turn it over to them. Just turn off the notifications. I may talk. Well, it's a very impressive report that you put together. Thank you. Thank you. Sydney and I's brains have been working hard yeah. together, but it's been really nice to collaborate. Well, the information is wonderful, but also just graphically, it's, it's very well uh, presented. It's, it's Thank you. Thank Appreciate you so it. Much. Thank you. Um, we had a good time. Did we spend too much time on it? Probably. <laughs> yeah, but it was a lot of time. It's a lot of stuff that we've accomplished. A lot of information. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I'll just start here. Perfect. Okay. So, we are super excited to share with you all the things that we accomplished last calendar year. Um, so we're going to provide an overview of all of that. Um, this report is unique because you get both of our perspectives. Um, I was in the role for the first half of the year. Maya was in the role for the second half of the year. So I think it's um, fun to hear different perspectives. So, uh, but before I dive in, I do really just want to express my deep gratitude for to Maya and just to our entire team. Um, being the work has been absolutely incredible i've come back and i've just looked at everything and i'm like wow, i don't know how you all did it but you did it and it looks fantastic um and it's just been really inspiring to see all the goals being accomplished and then some so i just want to scream from the rooftops that my did a beautiful job leading this department um and just shout that out because her hard work really went above and beyond so I would be remiss if I didn't go into that, but um, here's just a little bit of an overview of what we're going to cover tonight. And then next, um, our department's mission. So just a refresher, 
Um, we focus on strengthening relationships, expanding uh, awareness. We regularly engage, educate, and gather feedback from our amazing community members. Uh, since this report covers two fiscal years, which maybe we'll change this moving forward, but we're um, talking about 2022, 2023, and 24, or excuse me, 23, 24. Um, so you'll see that for both years, we've accomplished work for more than just board goal four, which is what I usually go over and talk about. Um, so in addition, we've been supporting even more efforts around public safety um, and ensuring that our district services are expanded, they're tr uh, transparent, effective, and um, also dabbling in parking, transportation, and community planning. So more on these goals later. Our responsibilities. Um, I'm not gonna go into each of these, but just super high level, we're gonna talk about community outreach, marketing, community integration, special projects, um, communication, and then just our other is just the day-to-day -day good stuff. So for our team's breakdown. Um, my role has been focusing more on communication. Um, Mai has been focused on outreach and Fiona, 75% of her time is going to marketing. But with all of those efforts, we saw a 101% increase in our community partnerships. So this slide outlines all 103 of them that we worked with throughout last year. <clears throat> We provided 19 community presentations last year, ranging from updates at IVCN to training O staffers and updating UCSD's online transfer module with um, both district related and just IV as a whole information. Um, that was a really long time coming. So we're excited about that and excited to do it again this year. We have 165 new subscribers to our newsletter last year and we sent 129 emails out. Um, this is just a breakdown of the sends, the individual, you know, sends, opens, and clicks. And then Fiona did a beautiful job revamping our newsletter. Um, I, I really love it. Uh, Constant Contact is not easy to work with, so she did a phenomenal job. This is kind of a mixture of putting in some pieces from Canva as well as what Constant Contact can do. Um, so she revamped that. We have like a high level, oh, the PDF. So there's a video in there. Um, you can kind of see what it looks like and then how our community center events are broken up into our community um, in our community room events. So they're separated out and much smaller, bite sized, way easier to read. And then we saw anywhere from zero to 500 website users daily um, with a huge spike around Deltopia with almost 2,500 users during that time. And then our website saw about 37,000 different users throughout the year. And I'll pass it over to Maya to chat about website updates. Thank you, Sydney. <gasps> um, so we've been quite busy with a bunch of different updates. I'm just going to make it look nicer. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, we have been making a lot of website updates with Fiona and I. So first we went through each program's website, made them more up to date with all the current offerings, some more graphics, consistent branding throughout. Um, we also revamped our survivor resources page, which is not up yet because we're still in the um, community stakeholder process where we review all the information with everybody and make sure it looks right, that we're understanding things properly and then putting it on um, for the public to see. Um, our web page for parking has been consistently updated thanks to Fiona and also translated into Spanish thanks to Leslie. Um, we also updated our home page. We have some new icons and things that we're working with. And then just overall just in, added some new resources. Um, won't go too long here. Check out the website, you know, but <laughs> we do have our new home page, some of the program updates, making the toggles better, um, and then also the parking web page as well. So contact us, that's when people reach out to us through our website. We saw a very big increase in 2023, 154 to 75 the year before. We have a lot of people knowing to come to us to ask questions, which is a huge accomplishment, I think, overall. We did see a decrease in press releases last year, which I will go into more detail about. However, we did see an increase in the amount of news articles that were written about us. So despite our lack of reaching out in some cases, people knew to come to us and who to ask questions to. Um, 
I talked a lot about the community calendar data, so I won't go into too much depth, but just know that primarily we're looking at open community events across the whole calendar in all different locations. Um, and we have some room for improvement in adding more public safety and volunteer opportunities. Now I'm going to dive in a lot about what a content request is. So a content request is something that happens internal. Sometimes people request us for things, but we are always doing this internal. It's how we communicate with Fiona, a different type of post we need. I'm gonna go all into the life cycle of a post and how much time that it takes. Um, but just know it can range anywhere between one to four hours to see one Instagram post be done, depending on the amount of partners, the amount of information that we're working with. So you can see that we've had 84 Instagram posts since she's been hired and 37 content requests. So she's very, very busy. Then looking at Instagram metrics, we've saw a 15, almost 1500 increase in our followers in the past year, um, which you can see is a lot more than we have thus far. So we're doing something right um, for a total increase of 108%. And we also see that we have a huge reach. So reach is how many people are seeing our page. And we reached about 80k. So 25 is organically. So that's the amount of people that we on our own can reach. And then we can see that 52k came from ads. So we'll see this a lot throughout the report. But Instagram ads are incredibly successful for getting our word out there. And to just prove this even more, these were our top posts by reach. You can see parking survey, Deltopia, cliff safety, Halloween, our town hall, and all of these were things that we put ads on. So we know that people are seeing them in large quantities. Um, the next slide goes over our top posts by likes. We can see the very top post by likes is unfortunately, the memorial. However, we also do see Halloween, um, a collaborative event, and one of our reels and an I Love Vista Beautiful post as well. So not all of these had ads, which is also great for us to know. People like the content. Um, so looking specifically at ads, you can see that when we put an ad, some ad on something, the bottom bar is also so showing the spike in reach and engagement. So we have paid reach, which is the number of accounts that saw it at least once, and then paid impressions. And that's the number of times your ads were seen on screen. Um, so you can kind of see the difference between those two, which can be multiple people, sorry, the impression. And then followers, we have mostly women on both Instagram and Facebook. Instagram, we have a younger demographic of about 18 to 24, and Facebook is just slightly over at about 25 to 34. Um, and we can see that our followers are both primarily based in Santa Barbara and Isla Vista region. Instagram is more focused in Isla Vista and Facebook is actually more focused in Santa Barbara. And we've also seen a steady increase in our Facebook followers as well. And reach because of our app. Um, and just to show you some of the incredible work that Fiona and our team have been able to do, we can see like the community spaces, calendar updates of things we have every week, some reels that she's made that have done really well, um, some branding for the collection, pickup, and yeah, so she's hard at work. So I want to talk to you about what goes into a post like that. So the first 50% of the time is a lot of communication between Fiona, the program managers, our CE team as a whole, and then creating content. So it's a back and forth process with lots of feedback. And then the other 50% of the time is distribution and how you edit that content to distribute to different channels. So whether that be changing the size from an Instagram post to a flyer, changing the language so that it goes better in a newsletter versus, the, um, versus an Instagram caption. So it's a lot about distribution. And then when we move into what a campaign is. So a campaign essentially is a series of different posts that we release one at a time. And they have a huge community outreach component as well. So we're not just posting the information. We're also tabling. We're going to community events. We're talking about it at our community meetings. We're um, connecting with different partners, looping people in. And so you can kind of see how a campaign takes a lot more time. Um, more so in the planning development side of things because it's a longer process that can take anywhere between six weeks, 10 weeks, or even happen seasonally. Um, but less time for creating content because a lot of it is reused throughout that time. So campaigns you would recognize, Halloween, Deltopia, Spring Festival, things of that nature. 
And so in 2023, we completed 22 campaigns as a team, which is really great. We currently have about four in progress and about six on the horizon. And more on outreach. We've had 18 community outreach events, 217 total hours tabling, and 108 hours canvassing for these different topics. Here's our wonderful door hangers. We just completed another one right before this that we'll add to the slide next year. But you can see um, Hall or Halloween on the right, Delta will be on the left. And then some slightly more fun content. You can see all of the amazing things Fiona has created for parking study, both in English and in Spanish. And my team also created these really fun cars as a way to engage with our audience and have a little photo op. And then we also have our branded car cookies from the Parking Town Hall um, with a couple photos from that and some of our outreach materials. And I will pass it back over to Sydney. Thank you. Um, this is just an abundance of photos from the year. Um, spring festival, tabling, workshop, all that good stuff, mobility, um, and then just out in the community. So last year, we worked with Maya's team to revamp our budget town hall. Um, we previously weren't seeing very much engagement at these. And last year, we drew in about 35 participants into this space. Um, one thing to highlight is we do continue to offer Spanish interpretation at our events, translating our materials um, into Spanish and then when necessary, um, Mandarin as well. Um, thanks to Leslie for all of the Spanish interpretation and translation. We had 110 survey responses yeah. um, at the end of the event. Um, everyone was able to put in their winnings or their tax dollars, however you want to look at it. Um, into the categories that they found most important. So community programs, public works, and public safety were the top three. And then we'll move on to housing mediation. Yes, thank you. Um, we keep working to get the word out um, for this program. We um, had about 80 hours tabling and canvassing. Maya worked with IBTU to do some cross-collab workshops. Seven presentations, we keep um, communicating to property providers in those meetings and tabled at three UCSD rental housing fairs. So this is just a fun way to look at a snapshot of all the work that we did in 2023, um, just to kind of show our impact. So on the left, you'll see all of the like community focused stuff in terms of like um, presentations, tabling, canvassing. In the middle, it's more press relations and our newsletter. And then on the right is more social media focused. So. Circling back to our goals, I'll start with 22, 23. Um, each of these slides identify all the things that we did. So feel free to take a look, but I'll just kind of try and highlight the high level stuff. But this is kind of a good chunk of the presentation, so bear with me. Um, for public safety, we identified um, cliff safety issues. We interviewed community stakeholders. I spoke with fire and other EMS personnel to make sure that we were educating the community properly. Um, we took the time to really intentionally research cliff deaths. Um, and how the community has been impacted in different families. I spoke with a few different families. Um, and we're now working with EVPLA and Supervisor Cap's office to create a memorial bench and stone in IV. And to expand awareness, um, CSOs, now called SSPs, um, we highlighted um, Annette at the safety station. Our intern went and kind of spoke about what can be experience there, what happens there, and then we kind of try to work with IV Foot Patrol to bridge their communication, make things a little bit more digestible in terms of like ordinance information and changes, which you'll see coming out on the door hanger, among other different avenues, and then Maya held a town hall for IV Foot Patrol as well, and just continuing to build trust within our community. Um, in support of this goal, we put a lot of focus on enhancing festival efforts for Halloween and Deltopia. Um, fostering collaboration and distributing safety resources through our door hangers. Um, we also keep transparency at the forefront with all of our efforts, social media, website, all the different things, and just making sure our info is up to date so we're always making those changes as needed. And then our usual goal, um, board goal four. So a lot of this I already covered, but I'll just highlight a couple of things. Um, Jenna, Maya, and Fiona did a C-Click Fix campaign, something we haven't really done before. Um, and I think that it was pretty successful. 
Um, so they were out in the community. That's my touched on that, like all the different layers of a campaign. Um, but IVB, that program alone has a lot of community engagement. People love to see the befores and afters. Um, so it just goes to show how important public works is to our community. So we want to keep highlighting that among all the other things. And then we're in 23, 24 now. So I want to note that Fiona, um, started a brand audit this year. So with each program she met, they talked about colors, fonts, imagery, kind of to streamline some of that content. So moving forward, it can kind of not create itself, but just be a little bit easier and quicker. Um, so we had 16 focus groups um, and so a bunch of different stakeholders and 1,220 survey responses. So huge, huge accomplishment for parking. And then public safety for this fiscal year. Um, what we want to highlight is that Maya initiated sponsorships for Healing Justice, um, as well as the Starfish Connection. We also had held two psychological first aid trainings here in IV, one in the community room, one in the community center. Um, that was allowed for Ivy residents to attend. Um, and then the rest I've already, already chatted about. So some of the challenges that our department is facing, um, it was shared with me. Oh, wait, hold on. Oops. Um, I lost my notes one second. Okay, so here's a little bit of a breakdown of... Um, what I originally envisioned for this position, which was more half focused on outreach than communication, marketing, and special projects. But what you see that Fiona's actually doing is 70% of her time is going just to marketing, very little to outreach and communication and special project, special projects, which is totally fine. It's just a little bit different than what we originally talked about. Here's um, her marketing breakdown by program, where her time is going for Compost Collective, IVB, Community Spaces, and Community Festivals, and then a little trickle of the rest of the things, um, parking and mobility, and our other programs. So for challenges, um, yes, we talked about a decrease in press releases and how newsletters continue to be a little bit of a challenge, but honestly, we laid the foundation, people knew who to contact, so that's fine, but if we want to continue to make these happen, I think we're going to need to dedicate a little bit more staff time to these. Um, content creation continues to outweigh um, the time that we have for longer projects, which is where we see more of an impact with campaigns. And we continue to face issues around prioritization. We love to say yes, um, and we want to keep saying yes, but I think we just need more staff support to be able to do that, um, to prioritize some of these things. So we need to put a little bit more structure guidelines in place um, just to make sure that what we are doing is feasible. And lastly, because all of our time is going to content creation, um, we're not having as much time for analyzing um, our different strategies for that. Solutions. Um, I think it's pretty clear all the things that we shared um, that if we want to keep doing them all and then some of our other special projects, we're going to need a little bit more staff time to make that happen. Um, I think we can streamline some of our regular content creation. I've, we've talked to Fiona about it, some things that we can put in place to make that a little bit easier for her plate. And then really taking a look at our department as a whole um, and prioritizing what every single program needs on a monthly basis, because we get all those content requests and at a certain point, like, where do we say no? What do, what, what do we prioritize that's most important? Because we're doing a lot of things. Um, and then more check-ins with our incredible um, data intern, Safia, just to kind of keep checking in on those, um, how we can adjust our practices. So final slide, I promise. Proposed goals. So we want to create a lead IV program to enhance community engagement. We want to develop comprehensive CE guidelines that outline expectations across each of our programs. Um, we want to integrate program development and research into our operations to identify the services um, that we need to address and the different service gaps. Obviously more time for content creation. And the last one is a fun one. We would love to set some time aside to create a digital interactive map of IV. Um, a couple of times we've heard how people come to IV, they don't always know where to go. Um, so if we can put it in our new kiosk, 
um, people can come and we can kind of try to promote more accessibility and engagement with our current resources and services that we have because those are all amazing. So we'll use it in our kiosk and our outreach materials. And that is it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you both very much. It's a great <laughs> presentation. Um, I'll look to my board members, uh, Director Freeman. You might have touched on this earlier in the presentation, but it became much more relevant to me, the exact nuance of it at the very end of the presentation. And so mm. I'm, can you um, kind of carve out the difference between outreach and marketing? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to like that. By, by the way that you did. Oh, I did not. Hang on to that. Um, essentially, outreach is forward-facing boots on the ground in the community, the table link, the canvassing, the community presentations, that's more like the outreach side. And then marketing is more creating the graphics, the flyers, the door hangers, the all the things. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm curious uh, with respect to the Isle of Vista Beautiful program, mm -hmm. um, is the, like, I, I mean, does, does the, like, the signs that are on the, the trash cans, what do you count as those? Like, what are the ones that tell you how to use the trash cans? Those are probably not like, is that even your department or is that I List of Beautiful? So that is Fiona did make those and those would come in the form of a content request, um, like okay. a post, just a different form because it's a flyer. So, and, yeah. that, and that, how does that in your um, time constraints, how does that, is that, is that end up, is a special project then or is that a, like, well, how does that, yeah. It kind of falls into content requests because that's how they're communicating they with it. I don't see con the, 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 the only or, things on the time breakdown are special projects, marketing, communication, and outreach. Marketing. Marketing. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah that's yeah. okay. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, Do you have additional follow-up questions that maybe we can shed light on? Because I know it... There's a lot of terms and there's a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really, it's really, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's something where it's like, I, it makes sense for me that we have the people like a centralized people in our organization that are concentrating on that. But also like, from like my, I, I, I just kind of like was, un, until you started defining out what it was, it didn't occur to me. And it tells where it is, like it is the marketing thing here. Um, but I was kind of think, like mentally tracking it as part of like what the beautiful staff was doing. But so mm -hmm. I guess, but, so, but, but that's, the, the task, the ball for that has been handed back to your department. And so I guess we need to make certain so, that you're like have the people required to make certain that they're able to get the things that they need to get done done. Yeah. Like Jenna works on making that happen, right? Like she did all the work to make it so that we could have that. Mm -hmm. But then to make something that goes out into the community that then falls back to our department. Yeah. So it's like, and yeah. sometimes they'll share like an idea, like sometimes mm -hmm. people even make something and be like, okay, I kind of want it to look like this. This is the information I want on it. Like, can you just make this look better? And so sometimes, I mean, simply put, that's what it is. And so sometimes that happens, like for that project specifically, Jenna said, you know, I would like one for each program. Let's all talk about what content we want. And then Fiona can help it make it come to life and something that looks really nice. Um, but yeah, it just kind of depends. Sometimes it's just the content. She makes it from scratch. Yeah. And like same with the kiosk, like that kiosk is empty essentially right now. And so now we're working on building all of the flyers, the, the calendars, all the things that you are like to put in there to make it pretty. And, and is that accessible. falling under marketing or is that falling under communication? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to call it. I'm going to call it marketing because like all of our social media management is essentially marketing. So it's like creating the graphics and it's also communication. Right. Okay. So yeah. I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm no, just trying no, to understand because no, I want to make sure that, like, cause, uh, uh, that we can support you in solving the problems that you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, accidentally the white yeah, mouse button. I closed this thing. So, yeah, go back. so you've got under your proposed goals. Um, one mm -hmm. of these here is the support for content creation with the, uh, potentially hiring an intern. Maintain. Yeah. And is that part of that specifically then be able to help alleviate this giant marketing section? For Fiona? Yeah. Okay. Um, so that we're taking like the day to day, the community spaces, weekly events, the, the things that can basically write, like I said, write themselves, but just dropping in the content. If Fiona creates those templates with the brand that each program has decided upon, then they will, yeah, it'll be a lot more streamlined and an intern can do it and create the content and then we'll do the back end. Okay. 
Uh, one question, um, just in case it ends up coming to this, because it just like provide more feedback, no, sorry, provide more potential information input to the committee that I'm not on, finance committee, I'm very happily not on. Um, from the perspective of the current breakdown of the uh, programs that are utilizing marketing, um, is it something where you would kind of want to just elite, like this is a reasonable breakdown for you, but you want to alleviate this pain on the jet project manager? Or would you also, are you feeling that there are slices of this pie chart that you want to be like, you know, they're currently like getting compressed because of other ones. Um, and, and you want, you would like to see a different breakdown of this, of the pie chart, like maybe less Isla Vista Beautiful, less compost collective, so you can get in more community spaces or more parking mobility or something like this. Like, how do you feel the, yeah. Where's your goal state on the on that second pie chart? The first one feels more obvious to me, um, but mm -hmm. the second one I'm trying to yeah. No, I think that's a really good question because I actually just met with Fiona this morning and now that I'm back in this, the capacity that I am and now with Fiona in her capacity, we met this morning and we'll just talk about the 15% of community festivals. Like we met, we wrote down all of the things that need to happen from now until spring festival. Um, that's a new website page. That's the door hanger. That's all of the social media. There's like at least four different posts and all of the events. We're having a party safety for all of it. We're having an Arcan distribution um, and we're having something else that I'm not remembering, but we're having a lot of things. Um, so how do we divide and conquer that? Um, so we broke down the list. I took half, she took half. So yes, 15% of her time and it's not 20, it's not all the time. Um, I guess to answer your question though, I, the way that I'm envisioning it right now today is Fiona's more focused on our everyday programs, the compost collective, the IVB, the community spaces. And then I'm more focused on the special projects, the cliff safety, the parking study, the mobility, the this, the this. So that's why I think a lot of her time isn't going to some of these other things. That Did I even well, that's the first pie. I'm mis <laughs> misunderstanding. The first pie chart has the special projects versus marketing, but I'm wondering within the marketing, you've got um, specifically the um, marketing breakdown by program. Yeah. And I'm wondering whether the whether whether like your goal for this is to, for example, like if you bring on more support for making the marketing part of the project manager's time lower. Okay. Yeah. Would the second pie chart, marketing breakdown by program, look about the same because everything's been sort of changed? Or is it that like actually like we're we really want to you, know, you were just talking a lot about community festivals, so I'll use that example. There's mm -hmm. a lot more you want to do on community festivals and you're just not getting it done right now because mm -hmm. you're needing to get something mm -hmm. else done. Mm -hmm. And so and that that I, I'm just bringing it up as like might affect when finance committee is looking at this where it gets budgeted because yeah. it's like okay well, we want to like we 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 are going to bring on somebody who's mostly going to focus on parking or mostly going to focus on mm -hmm. or is it something or is it that like um everything currently needs to get more um like when, when you fix the problem do you anticipate that you're when you come back with a marketing breakdown by program it will still say 25 percent isla vista beautiful or will isla vista beautiful be down to 15 percent because community festivals is up to 35 percent mm -hmm. that sort of thing mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I, Go for it. Yeah, so I think that roughly for Fiona's time and for like what a potential intern's time, the pie chart will probably look similar because those processes would be streamlined. I think the only time that it would, well, because the new content is being made for community festivals because we work with a graphic designer. And so that designer then works with Fiona and then she takes that and makes content from it. But I mean, some, of these, some of these are really small, like sort of like safety stations, 1%. I could see you saying that like, yeah. you know, I love safety stations to be 10%. And I don't know right. if anyone like, would be sad about that. But. <laughs> yeah, and so. same with like survivor research. We have a ton of housing mediation. I mean, there's a lot here that's not getting marketed in the same way that I think are just as important as these three. The difference is, is that these three have project managers that are asking for that support and these ones aren't. So like, okay, I understand that. I'm yeah. advocating for safety stations and housing mediation. Maya is advocating for survivor resource center. So it's like those other programs have just fallen to different people, um, but they don't have their own project manager, right? So that work falls to us. So like we do the housing mediation, like in terms of the community presentations, we do all of that for, not all of it for safety stations, but I work with the SSPs to get that messaging across. So 
That is fascinating. Thank you so much, both of you, for kind of going into that with me a little <laughs> okay. bit. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Kind of understanding that of like kind of like the root cause of why some sections are smaller than other ones. It's totally. Organizationally really interesting. So yes. thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you. Break the brain. So first off, I just want to say uh, that uh, I'm really proud of both of you because this is a bunch of just really good things that you've been able to accomplish this year. And even though we had two people in the same role uh, for different parts of the year, um, the quality was there for the whole year. So um, just great work. Congratulations. Um, and so my question, I would just want to dig deeper. And talk to me. I was like, oh, I have been doing that a lot, haven't I? <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it is because everyone's doing so many great things. And especially when I was, you know, trying to fill Sydney's role, I just wanted to make sure that everything was getting done and like making sure everyone want need everything they had, they it was needed, they got what they needed. Um, so I was not saying no really ever. And so when Sydney came back and kind of saw that, she's like, Oh, this is great. We're doing everything, but we're doing way too much. Um, and I think that kind of helped me put into perspective a little bit about like some of the things that Sydney does in order to prioritize. And when we were talking about, you know, her coming back into the role and passing off some of these responsibilities, we also thought about, well, well, how do we prioritize? We don't really have something as it is in place to say no to things. Like there isn't really a priority of community engagement. Like what is more important than something else that like needs to be promoted? Um, and not saying that, you know, that, that we have, I, I have any idea for that right now, but yeah. that is something that I think we need to put in place. I don't know that it needs to be a policy or like mm -hmm. an internal guideline or something. Just um, setting some expectations, I think, for each program and just making sure that we're consistent because like to Jay's point, uh, some of our other programs aren't getting the same amount of support. And I think we need to outline that. Like, what does that look like? What time are we dedicating, whether it's every month, every quarter, to each program and be very consistent and very transparent about that. I think to Maya's point, I did come back and kind of say like, I love all the things we're doing and it's too much. And we tried to outline a lot of these goals prior to me leaving, but things snowball. I mean, there's all these things come up and we want to do it all and be everywhere. And I love that. And I don't want our team to get burnt out. Um, and I think that's where I'm coming from is I'm very like protective of Maya's time, of Fiona's time. Like there is a little bit of element of that, frankly, it's burnout happening. And I don't want that to continue. So like, let's take a pause, let's reassess and let's see where our time needs to be going. Um, and then just making sure we're all on the same page. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's good. That, that makes all the sense in the world to me. And uh, even if you don't have like everything figured out right now, I appreciate you being willing to say that, but also it's clear you're thinking really hard on it and trying to figure out how to, to work it out. So I think I totally support you in doing that um, because uh, of course it, in the way that even with Jay's questions uh, that I, I always kind of knew, but never really put it together. This is kind of like, whereas in other organizations that I've seen, it's like, you know, you've got a department and you've got, they've got their communications person and they're the ones who are, you know, they're responsible for that. They direct them, but it's all a bit different because of the way that we've set it up where people are coming to you and you're having to figure out how to prioritize, like you said. So yeah. um, I think it's good that you're thinking about that. Um, yeah. And also just making sure that, sorry to interrupt you, but I'm just making sure that we are putting more time to our really important programs, the safety station survivor resource have all these different things that doesn't have a project manager to advocate for them. I think that's good. Um, and then just my second question is, um, so uh, you mentioned 2.5 FTEs for employees. Yeah. What, how many do we have now currently today? Well, two. 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 Yeah, two. So the 0.5 would be an intern. Yeah. Okay. And probably not the 0.5, probably like a 0.25.
Like, yeah. how can we figure out how to take the responsibilities that we can better do with a lower level position and get those things done so that your time can be spent with the higher order stuff. So. Yeah, like the different, the special projects, right? Like the cliff safety and the parking and the, the, the some of the other things that we didn't really touch too much on, but yeah. Okay, I have a few questions. So I'm gonna um, just clarify. I, I like misinterpreted the proposed solution of adding two and a half staff members. So you're saying that. Oh, no, no, sorry. <laughs> Total. Got it. Total. Got it. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> um, and so uh, my initial like questions I wanted to ask were around the website metrics. And so we had the huge spike um, right around Deltopia last year. Um, what specific areas were folks clicking on when they were visiting our web page? Um, around Deltopia. For Deltopia, we have one web page for Deltopia, and it encompasses all Spring Festival and all the resources that are on the door hanger, all of those safety resources. So safety stations, um, Narcan distribution. But what's nice about the website is there's the links to them. What you get on the door hanger is just whatever we can fit. And then we yeah. put the QR code to our website that gives you access to all of that information. Got it. That was going to be my next question. So we're we're very confident that like majority of our users were using the QR code with their mobile yes. device and visiting the web page in that way. So we had had two. Mm -hmm. so we had a pretty hefty ad yeah. last year. Last yeah. So we had like a social media ad that allowed people to go to our website directly. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. I mean, did uh, for the social media ad, you broke down like the spending. Did we spend more on that week when yes. we had the biggest website spike? Okay. Same with Halloween. Got it. Those two times get a lot. And so then on the number of website users, our second star, which is a lot smaller, but still a star and still important, um, <laughs> is after Halloween. And it's like a very consistent month long click rate. Do we know what topic that was? So I put a huge web page of all of the people that were involved in our community festival on our website and it stayed there for about a month. So that means when people were seeing the press about our event, they were looking at our website and like seeing everything that was there. Got it. So this the parking study survey. Oh, that's true. That too. Oh, I should have known that. It was so. pretty huge ad for that. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Um, wow. And so I'm thinking like we just this uh, yeah. Mm. I don't have any more specific questions at this time, but I, I am curious, like I'm trying to think of a better question for more of my website mm -hmm. curiosity, but I'm glad that we've jumped in requests because we can fit more information on there. Um, mm -hmm. Something that we didn't talk about on the website, which is really interesting, is that people are coming to our website for one reason. Like, so they're probably Googling something that they're looking for, finding the resource, clicking our website, and that it's like a very quick interaction. So we didn't even talk about like the time spent on our website, but a lot of them are like under a minute or like 30 seconds or less, because I think they're coming for one thing. Um, and so I think what we want to do is really improve the time spent on our website and then also like the reoccurring visitors as well. Because that's a number that I think is increased. It yeah. just, we have to just spend a bit more time on our website. I, I did see that we, you know, the average like session is 58 seconds and then they're you're yeah. usually going to one more page other than their initial click. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, still think it's very successful. So thank you. Um, is there any other board questions? Yeah, I'll go to the public. Is there any public or are there any board members on Zoom that I'm missing? I can't see. Okay. No, you're good. Okay. okay. Um, then I'll go to the public. Yes. If it helps you feel better, I think I'm one of those people who go and stay like five seconds. I, I check our address a lot, so I might be not down for you. So <laughs> maybe that helps you feel better. Thank you. Um, all right. Anyone on Zoom who might be public, can you raise your hand or speak now? 
I don't think we have many. Um, so I'll go back to the board for any board commentary, further discussion, et cetera. Director Brand. I might be bringing the metric up on having the agenda open right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe it'll balance out. It's gonna be a really long um, user. I uh, <laughs> yes, super user. Love yeah. that. <laughs> uh, you got seven of them here, at least. Um, well, I uh, am just really impressed with everything that's going on, and um, I am really excited about your goal of the Lead Academy for this year. I think that that's one of the things that can really take us to the next level and help set not just a good foundation for where we're at now, but a good foundation for where we're at five years from now by helping to further educate the community and develop that leadership. So um, I would love to help be involved in that in any way that can be helpful and um, just really excited for that and appreciate that, you know, like not a lot of uh, government agencies or even nonprofits when they talk about doing outreach also have like door-to-door -door canvassing and uh, maybe <laughs> tabling. Tabling is probably a pretty common one, but the fact that you're going and, um, you know, spending those 108 hours, like reaching out to people that weren't otherwise coming to us, like those are the people that I feel like it's most valuable that we're getting in touch with, the people that aren't seeking us out because uh, it could help create a relationship to maybe they will seek us out in the future. Um, so just great job with everything. Thank you. By the way, Maya graduated from the Galita Lead Academy. I did. Yeah, she did. I did go. Thank you. I loved it. And Sydney had told me that she had had the idea. And so when I went and took the class, I stole the binder. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Here we go. I didn't steal it. It was mine. But um, yeah, we have a really cool foundation from what Galita did. So it makes it even more fun. Awesome. Yeah. Spencer had brought the idea to me. He's like, we should do this. And I'm like, I love this idea. There it is. And then Yay. Maya got to go through the program. So now here we go. We're gonna make <laughs> we're gonna make one for Ivy. Yep. You are a spy from Isle of Vista. I am. I don't I know was... if they've let us go through it. I told them I was a spy right off the bat. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> you're honest. I was spying. Um, yeah, I loved it. All right. Um, well, thank you both very much. Um, yeah. A lot of accomplishments here to be proud of, even things not listed in this presentation to be proud of. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you stop sharing your screen. Yeah. <laughs> um, and with that, we will move on to our next agenda item, uh, the draft mobility plan, existing conditions and needs assessment. All right, so another great report for you guys today. Uh, we have Emily and Jennifer from the Dixon team uh, here to present the mobility plan, existing conditions and needs assessment uh, report. They've got a presentation that summarizes the work that was done and you also have the full report attached. So you're encouraged to note any comments or questions on the main report, but for the presentation, we're going to go through the PowerPoint that they've provided. So I'm going to allow sharing and turn it over to Emily and Jennifer. Thank you guys for all your hard work on this in a quick timeline. All right. Thank you. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And this is just a very brief presentation. Um, basically, what we've done here is summarize the existing conditions and needs assessment findings. And we've basically summarized for each mode of transportation the top five um, most notable key takeaways for you all, just to make sure that we're on the right track, that we're capturing the key information. And then at the end, if you have any additional feedback or comments, and then once you've had a chance to dive into the report more deeply, we'd love to hear any feedback that you all have. Um, starting with pedestrians, so in terms of existing conditions, we noted that 42% of the sidewalks are actually missing, and there's a further breakdown of that information in the report. Um, we know that some of the intersections are missing stop signs. Um, there's a lack of lighting in some locations. Um, ADA compliance was something that came up for certain bus stops or sidewalks. 
um, as well as the impact from cars parking on curbs or creating just an unsafe environment for pedestrians. And then on the flip side over here on the right, we have the top five needs assessed. And so these actually come from an extensive multi-year community engagement campaign that you all are familiar with. Um, and this is just a summary of some of the top issues that the community um, brought up during the effort. And so one of the items was just that the area needs to have an improved sidewalk network, um, whether that means removing obstructions or expanding sidewalks, um, addressing gaps, making them more accessible. Um, painted crosswalks was requested by a lot or just making the intersections um, feel a lot more safe um, when crossing the street. Better lighting throughout Isla Vista was requested. The need for more stop signs was definitely brought up, especially at some of certain intersections that are trickier to navigate. Um, and then just better sight lines in general. So those are the main trends for pedestrian. For cycling, we heard that basically um, some of the bike infrastructure we found is disconnected. So within, but also to access all of the great bike bike infrastructure surrounding Isla Vista. There was a lack of connection in some cases. Um, the Pardal Tunnel definitely seems to be the most common bike path and access point into IV. Um, in general, there was just a lack of bike parking throughout IV. And one of the things too, is that this includes a lack of parking on people's private property. So where they live, um, and then cyclists, there's a mix of uses, so both recreational and commuter biking. Um, and then <laughs> comes as no surprise, but the private bike ownership is definitely significant in this area. Anyone who's been to Ivy just sees the plethora of bikes all over Ivy. So um, on, in terms of the needs assessed, so the community shared that they want more multi-use paths um, both that are shared for pedestrians and cyclists, um, more bike lanes in general, um, especially protected bike lanes, just making sure that experience feels safe, um, more bike parking and storage, uh, traffic calming to slow down vehicles and other bicycles, but also um, a general need for pavement improvements. Moving on to the bus section. So existing conditions included um, the fact that on MTD, the ridership has not quite rebounded to the pre-pandemic levels. That unfortunately seems to be a nationwide trend in a lot of areas. Um, there are five bus routes that MTD run somewhat infrequently or are unreliable. Um, and we noted as well that bus stops um, typically lack accessibility, um, whether that be seating, the shelter and the lighting concerns as well. Um, free transit is offered to students, so that's a really great resource. And we know that there are reduced rates offered to the youth, seniors, Medicare card holders, and persons with disabilities as well. And then um, MTD is also planning to launch a microtransit service. And then in terms of the needs assessed, um, we heard from the community that there is a need for more direct bus service to popular destinations. Um, both in and around IV, and um, as a way of getting more people to ride the bus. More frequent bus service was also requested. And, um, and in addition to that, basically extending that into the later evening hours. Um, we saw a request for more bike rack capacity on the buses themselves and um, improved amenities at bus stops as well as just an increase in bus stops um, in some of the residential areas in particular. And then for regional transit, existing conditions, basically we noted that Goleta, the, the Isla Vista area is served by the Goleta Amtrak station, Santa Barbara Amtrak, the Santa Barbara airport, those are the three main like regional connection points to get outside of the IV region. Um, in terms of connecting outside of the county, the most common modes of transportation are train, bus, shuttles, and flights. We also know that ride hailing services, so like Uber and Lyft, 
are a really common way of accessing um, the Amtrak stations or the airport when traveling from Isla Vista. Um, the Amtrak via the Goleta station is one of the most, it's actually the third most common mode of transportation for trips that are taken outside of Santa Barbara County. Um, and that there is no direct bus access to the Goleta or Santa Barbara Amtrak stations from Isla Vista. In terms of the needs assessed, so actually the topic of regional transit was not something that came up a lot in the prior outreach that was conducted, but something that was noted was just a general request for more easy and convenient ways to access the different regional transit hubs. Um, moving on to vehicle, and this is something that our team knows quite a lot about because we're also working on the parking study side of things. But um, we've noted that there is a um, compliance challenge. So vehicles are often parked illegally, um, whether that be blocking driveways, sidewalks. Um, this is an emergency access concern. Um, there is a lack of wayfinding signage. So signage that's basically directing folks on where um, key destination points are or how to access parking options. Um, there's a lack of designated pickup and drop off zones for rideshare vehicles or um, carpooling spaces. There are um, just a few loading zones on Pardal, but mostly um, it's common to see delivery drivers parking in the middle of the street, obstructing traffic, um, and that there's typically a speed limit of 25 miles per hour in most locations. Um, in terms of the needs assessed, the community has requested an, uh, more enforcement so um, it's very, that's something that we heard a lot too on the parking study side of things. Um, reducing the, the need, so reducing car dependency in general. So how can we get more folks to use alternative transportation? Um, the community would like more traffic calming measures, um, improved sight lines into intersections. And that's something that um, relates to some upcoming daylighting legislation that was just passed as well. And then we know that the community brought up pick up and drop off zones and delivery zones as well as being a need. And micro mobility. So um, basically uh, scooters and skateboards, the existing conditions was that there's not very many existing um, scooter and bike corrals and that it's pretty common to see scooters just parked in the middle of the sidewalk or kind of blocking the street and left haphazardly. Um, in terms of the county shared mobility device permit program, um, basically there are currently up to 400 scooters allowed in Isla Vista per that permit. The scooters and skateboards are not permitted on sidewalks technically, um, but it's common for folks to ignore that policy. There's not any designated skateboard or scooter lanes in IV. And um, the most heavily utilized scooter share routes occur typically along Pardal um, and in several other areas throughout IV. And then in terms of the needs assessed, we know um, it was identified that the pavement conditions could be improved in certain locations. There's a need for more street lighting. Um, secure skateboard racks is something that came up um, as well as scooter parking. Um, additional corrals or zones for scooters, and then just the need for more enforcement, especially of speed limits. Um, some of those safety concerns came up. And with that, um, just a brief update on next steps. So basically, we will be taking your feedback, um, incorporating it into the draft reports, so we can wrap up those sections, and then we'll be moving on to the actual drafting of the recommendations. And that will culminate in the draft mobility plan. Um, and there will be additional steering committee and board and public um, opportunities for input throughout that process as well. And then um, we'll just open it up to any questions or comments. And then we have our contact information down below. Um, once you've had a chance to read the report, you're welcome to send us any additional comments. And with that, I will stop my screen share. There we go.
All right, thank you very much for that presentation. Are there any directors with questions at this time? Director Freeman. Yes, thank you so much for all of the excellent rapid work you did in this. Um, the question I would have been interested in, I don't know if this is something that we, anyone has information already, if nothing else, I'm just saying it would have been, now that I've seen this, Maybe someday we can learn what's going on with this. The thing about ridership on MTV is not rebounded to pre-pandemic levels. And when I think about that, I wonder whether it's you know, some mixture of the two of these, but I wonder what the ratio is. Some mixture of people doing all the things they used to be doing, but being afraid to use buses and therefore not using buses, or whether it is merely that, from the perspective of the buses merely, not from the perspective of society merely, but from the perspective of buses merely that people aren't doing as much out. Um, like there's a, I mean, a lot of places, like a lot of restaurants aren't open as late now. And a lot of like nightlife isn't existing in the same way. And a lot of meetings are occurring online. And I'm wondering whether or not we should maybe expect ridership on MTD to be lower now than, it, than it was pre pandemic because people aren't like, are like how many of these not lack of use of MTD is now being done by car or is just people not going anywhere. That's what I'm wondering like what ratio is. And one thing I'll say, go, go ahead. Emma. No, I was just going to share. That's a really interesting point. I think it's worth digging into. I think another factor too is um, looking at just the increase in car ownership that occurred during the pandemic and how that kind of has eaten away at the use of buses. But but yeah, I, um, you make the good point about maybe people just aren't going out as much anymore. <laughs> So yeah, not, it, I'm sure it's a combination of all of those issues. I think there's also a chicken and the egg situation where there were there was better bus service before the pandemic and the headways haven't fully recovered. So people are less inclined to use it if there's 30 minute waits compared to before mm -hmm. there were less waits to be on the bus. So it could be that too. I was gonna ask um, on this, uh, bus ridership. To be clear, this includes riders who might start their journey in Isla Vista to take the bus outside, or is this specifically only folks riding within like the fuzzy box of Isla Vista? It's all the routes that's here might be, so wherever they go. So if they start here, but they're going downtown, this is part of this ridership. Got it. Yeah. Uh, Director Topler. I um, <clears throat> excuse me was just interested in a general sense of the timeline of uh, how we're going to move forward and um, uh, when we're going to be back with the public and when we're going to have our final recommendations. Sure. Um, in terms of next steps, so what we kind of expect is that um, we'll be able to wrap up the existing conditions and needs needs assessment within probably the next month or so um, once we get all of your comments. And then um, in terms of the recommendation stage, I mean, we're working on a pretty condensed timeline. And so we expect that we'll be able to turn that, that, uh, that around fairly quickly um, as well. And so I don't have the exact date in, um, unless Jonathan, you know, the exact date for when we'll come back to you all for input, but I imagine it'll be fairly quickly here. Yeah, I think the, the goal is to have recommendations uh, public in May and to uh, you know, get those feedback and then wrap it up shortly after that. We do have until next March from CARB, like they extended our- got an extension. They did, they, they gave us a pretty generous extension more than we asked for. Um, but we want to get on. But we do want to get this done so that we can apply for other funding. Uh, so we have an incentive to finish. Um, the parking town hall or the parking recommendations are going to be coming out in April, May as well. So it'll be on a similar maybe timeline. Thank you. out um i my question was about the um both the cycling and the micro mobility 
Um, I just uh, was looking at, I think it's point number five under cycling, uh, talking about how I live has fewer bike services. When you're talking about that, do you mean like bike sharing services? I think it's, um, that's a part of it, but it's also just um, companies where you can go and get your bike repaired. Um, so just access to bike um, services in general. We also have only two bike lanes or two and a half bike lanes in IV. I mean, when you compare it to the campus, like what's existing on UCSD campus versus what we have in IV, there's very little bike infrastructure in IV compared to the campus for how much bikes there are. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that makes sense to me. I, I wanted to call that out just because for, I with bike share in particular, which is something that I am really interested in, was a frequent user of the service uh, before UCSB and did their contract with the Hopper vendor. Um, it, I, I just wonder if that's something that be it had gotten any feedback about. You know, I have used the, the scooters, for example, on occasion, um, but one constraint that I see that may not be mentioned here is that because of local laws from the city of Goleta and UCSB's ordinances, you can't really take them outside of the box. So it's not really last mile transportation. Um, like the original vision of you could take a bike or a scooter to the airport or to the Amtrak station can't be realized because of how it works. So I'm just, in looking at that, that's like probably really the only gap that I see. And maybe I'm off base in seeing that as a big concern, but I, I wonder if it's something that you've heard feedback on um, that, that could be incorporated. There wasn't a ton of requests in the different outreach and surveys we did on people asking for e-bikes and like the B-cycle service. We've been asked to consider, you know, applying for grant funding to have some installed in IV, but there might be a district cost to that too. And it's kind of unknown if, you know, we'd have to have the city of Goleta also partner to make it viable. And so it's, but it would, it would be at a small scale at five uh, parking stations. Gotcha. Um, that, well, that's good to know. Um, the, the other question I had is on uh, Zipcar and car sharing. Did we get data from the company on utilization or is it really just more of like description of what's being offered now? We didn't get direct data from Zipcar, just it's just been it. Here's what it is okay. right now. Um, yeah, because I I know that during the pandemic they I think took them all out and then slowly have reintroduced some of them. So um, I don't know how much it impacts the existing conditions itself, but um, definitely something I'm interested in learning. Is I think it, they is were, back fully. <laughs> and I think they weren't around when we started the study, and I think they more very recently came back. So. We can check if we can get data, but I know they're brand new back. Gotcha. Um, okay, that's good to know. Um, yeah, I think I think that's all. I, all the questions I have. I'll ask a short question. Um, the order of these modes of transportation is it based on anything? Like, is pedestrian first because it's the highest, and micro mobility last because it's the lowest utilized? form of transportation? No, the order the order was just um, in terms of how we structured it in the report, but but no. Got it. Um, all right, that concludes my questions. Um, Director Brink. I forgot, I did have one more on page nine of the um, the not recommendations, the needs uh, was feedback from the Isla Vista Elementary School about the creation of a shortcut to the elementary school in the form of a designated pathway between the school and the intersection of Camino Corto and Abrego. I think Sydney can speak to that. Yeah. She was there. 
Um, I'm sorry, Spencer, can you repeat the question? So it's on, on page nine for Isla Vista Elementary School, there's uh, a sentence that describes how during the meeting, the attendees requested a pathway between the elementary school and Camino Corto. Yeah, I think um, at least from what we heard with the pop-up, it wasn't necessarily pathway that we heard. It was more of like a marked crosswalk, has some flashing beacons, like just more visible. It's also kind of dark over there, um, just a safer overall intersection. Um, gotcha. I think that's the pathway from like, yeah, that corner to the actual path that takes you, the, the dirt path that takes you through. Gotcha. So more a street. Um, yeah. That, okay. That makes sense. There's connection to that. Yeah, yes, exactly. I'm thinking about how I walk up down that pathway all the time. So I was just confused by that. Um, thanks. Um, I had a quick question. I don't know who for, um, but I know in terms of like the scooters and them being everywhere, including in the middle of the sidewalks, there was some talk of like working on geofencing and potentially only having like certain areas in which you like could park the scooters in order to turn them off. And I just wonder like if we've looked into that anymore, if it's something we think is realistic for the community, just because I think that would be like a good way to kind of force people to like have to move them out of the way. Yeah, I, I can speak to that. Um, there is definitely precedence in other areas of the state, in the country, where you can get the vendors to set up the geofencing. So that is one of the items that we did call out or want to call out um, in the recommendation section if there is going to be pursuit of that moving forward. There's also yeah, an opportunity. Share. Oh, go ahead, Emma. There's also an opportunity, I know, in some of the apps where you can require the user to take a, a photo of where they, they've parked the scooter and submit that to show that it's parked in a legal location and not blocking the sidewalk. Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't think that's in place today, but maybe someone else is familiar with that. Well, we know at least, so, you know, the county controls this. We don't have any control over this. So one of the recommendations might be something we advocate to the county to do. But they have 115 uh, scooter parking spots right now in IV, but there's 400 scooters. Um, or I think there's only 300 right now, but it, it possibility for up to 400. Uh, they have, so they have um, 14 parking locations and then five, about five or six that they're planning to build out, but that still probably wouldn't accommodate all the parking needs. Um, and they would need to create that as a requirement in their permit when they work with the providers. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the information we have. So it would be the County Public Works Department that we would advocate to to implement something like that, but they're also still working to get the needed parking to make that happen. Yeah just to share that when we've talked with the county prior about geofencing, they're very on board and they're open to our recommendations because I know um, different groups have reached out to them like IVRPD, you can turn it off so it can't go into the parks and things like that. So it's definitely, they're, they're open to our recommendations. So we should work with them. Yeah, some of our recommendations might be where additional parking spots need to go. For example, you know, they pile up on El Colegio, so. All right, um, I don't see any further board questions. So I'll go to the public. So any public comment or question at this time? All right, I'll return to the board. Uh, is there any further board commentary, discussion, et cetera? No. If you do read the reports, please email, uh, email that Emily put or you can send them to me. Um, but our staff has looked has been looking at them too, and we're submitting feedback. And uh, you know, our, our stakeholder groups like the county and MTD have them as well. So. All right. Um, well, thank you all very much for this report. Uh, thank you to our consultants for jumping on fast. Thank you to our CSD staff for continuing to be excellent with outreach here. Um, and we'll move on to our next agenda item. Uh, the next agenda item, 4.3, the support for HR 7525, 
Special District Grant Accessibility Act. Director Deschler asked for this item to be added to the agenda. And it was part of the call to action from the California Special Districts Association. Um, and it's an important bill because um, the uh, federal government currently doesn't really recognize special districts as an entity to fund. And that came up during the COVID pandemic as when the COVID relief funds are coming out. So this bill would help us uh, have a definition for what a special district is in federal uh, statutes. And so that we would be more eligible for federal funding as a you know collection of organizations in the future. So it was a call to action from CSCA for districts to endorse a support position so that we can sign on to their letter. And uh, I know our representative, Salute Carvajal, has been in close touch with them about this. He's not, I don't think he's on this bill yet. I could, I could be wrong, but I know that he's been, uh, he, he's very familiar with special district issues as, as a county supervisor for a long time. Yes. Director. This sounds like a great bill that we should support. I move that we do that. Okay. Second. All right, we have a quick motion and a second. Um, is there any board commentary at this moment on this motion? Is there any public comment on this motion? All right, um, then with that, I will ask for a vote. Director Schultz? Yes. Dr. Craig? Yes. Dr. Freeman? Yep. Dr. Topliff? Yes. Dr. Brandt? Yes. Dr. Aguilar? Yes. All right, great work, folks. That motion passes. Um, and now we'll move on to our next agenda item, the STEP grant spending update. Okay, so this is just part of our budget process, just giving you all an information on where our grant spending has been. Um, as of September of, uh, sorry, as of June of 2023, when most spending had uh, ceased with the step grant until more recently, we had 39,000 left over in the grant as of June 30th. There's maybe only 2,000 more dollars to add on, but we don't have that figure yet. Um, and then in the next slide, you'll see that we've spent 30,000 so far uh, to get these reports into better shape with the Dixon team. And we had already committed that we knew that the grant wasn't going to take us through to the end. So there are going to be additional expenses, you know, another 30,000 essentially. So we have 39,000 left in the grant. We have 30,000 left to spend to finish the project. So we're going to have to put in 20,000 or 21,000 of our district funds to finish the project, uh, mostly in this fiscal year. So that's in addition to what we've already budgeted. Yeah, all we budgeted was the grant money. So yeah, it is in addition to what we budgeted because um, yeah, we had the extra expenses of switching providers. Yeah, that's the SEP grant spending. And do you think that's adequate then? I mean, that should do it? It should. It depends on how much more feedback we get, if any, on the reports. We've already done one round of feedback internally um, with myself working with Emily. And I think they're in pretty good shape at this point. But we know that you all have unique perspectives in the community that I might not have. And um, People like MTD, like Hillary Blackaby, is also just back from maternity leave. So she might have some things to add on, but I don't think it'll be major changes. And that's to finish this stage. Um, and then the recommendations, I imagine going, I mean, it's smoother because there's less data collection work and it's more providing ideas and solutions to the problems presented. So it should be fine. I, I can't say definitively, but. Um, with the amount of work I've seen them do for $30,000, we have 30,000 left. I think it should be, it should be enough, but I can't, I don't want to be held to that hundred percent. And you don't anticipate that'll go into the next fiscal year? You think we'll be done? We hope not. Year? Yeah. We hope to 
finish. I mean, there might be a small amount in the next fiscal year. There's a component of this that we want to do, which is we get the recommendations. We go to the public with them and they give us their priorities for those recommendations. So then we can rank them. But then there's maybe a component that does go into the next fiscal year, which is uh, going directly to the three decision-making entities, uh, the county, UCSB, and MTD, and sharing the recommendations with them. That might have to go after June, but that's not that labor intensive. That's just more making sure that the people who would be implementing these recommendations are fully informed about what they are before we give a final approval to the plan. So it's not a lot, it's not as much work in the next fiscal year, I think. Thanks. All right, are there any other board questions? All right, is there any public commentary on this update? See none. Um, is there any board discussion and commentary on this update? Only, only comment would be the sunk cost. We got to get it done, and we're <laughs> it, it, the fact that it's moved along so much in the last like two months uh, from where it had been at makes me feel confident that it's going to happen. I agree. I mean, what I'll say is like, yes, there was a long time period for the original phase where we had to do the, all the outreach, which was always going to take a long time. But the data collection and data compiling and writing has just gone so much. It's more was done in two months than was done in a year and a half. So I think I'm confident. All right. Um, seeing none, uh, I'm confident in that too. Do we need to make a, a motion specifically in any way? No motion. It's just uh, information for the budget. So. Okay. All right. We'll now move on to the next uh, parking study spending update. So this is the spend for the parking study so far. Um, we have we had fifty two thousand uh, two hundred fifty two thousand, and we've spent two hundred thirty five thousand so far. All that's left in the parking study are two things. It's drafting the recommendations and the community meetings about those recommendations. All the data collection is done now. Uh, March, two weeks ago, yeah, March like 10th weekend, that was the last weekend of data collection. That was like the most, uh, one of the biggest budget spend areas because of how labor intensive it is. So we only have two things left to do, which is uh, draft recommendations, which have kind of been done all along, like they've been, they, they haven't waited until now to draft recommendations, and then share them again with the community. And I think I provided that date that we have on the calendar right now, which is uh, May 15, 16, which is when the Dixon team will be back in person to have community meetings, town halls, to talk through the recommendations and make any edits. So they haven't alerted me of any issues with this remaining budget with the work that needs to be done and you know we meet pretty regularly every other week so things are looking good and we'll most likely get this done this fiscal year as well but again it might be another one of those situations where wrap-up work bleeds into the summer um, and we did say in our timeline that we would approve the final parking plan in the fall so that the uh, community had a chance to be here when we've taken, you know, we've taken the feedback during the May community sessions. So the final product will be not in the summer approved. So but it shouldn't be a lot of work after we get through the May community feedback sessions. Okay. All right. Are there any questions from the board at this time? Director Brick. You say May. 15, 16? Yeah, let, let me, uh, yeah, I'm just going off memory. Uh, it's uh, 15, 16, yeah. Okay. It's a Wednesday, Thursday. So we have a board meeting on the 14th, two next days. And there'll be a similar deal where it's a, a, a town hall in the evening and then just a series of one hour or one and a half hour focus groups with students, families, business owners, uh, 
beachgoers, all these different groups. And this budget doesn't count the community engagement staff time that's spent. Like it wasn't mentioned, you know, the report had so much in it, but like one of the things that was done the last three months has been, uh, they've been out on the beach tabling in the morning, in the afternoon and during sunset to talk to beach users. So that's something we're doing in-house. It's an internal cost. It's not part of the main part of the study budget. All right. Um, I'll go to the public. If there's any public commentary or questions, see none. So I'll come back to the board. If there's any board commentary at this time. Um, well, I'll say that I'm just as much in support of continuing to spend for this. Um, uh, I'll, I guess one last thing I'll add is we've received the check from UCSB, but we are waiting on the count. It's always someone. Someone's, <laughs> yeah, to pay us, you know, it a, we should have gotten a year ago, but it's okay. All right. Um, is that enough direction from all of us? Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. That concludes our discussion and action items, and now we'll move on to item five, reports. I'll begin with reports from members of the board. Are there any board members who have reports they'd like to share? Director Topwood. I'll uh, just mention that uh, Director Friedman and I met. Uh, Dr. Director Deschler was supposed to meet with us, but uh, got uh, waylaid at the last minute. But we did start talking about that program that we had imagined to um, do commendations. And uh, we hope to have some recommendations to bring back to the board soon that take into uh, account our bipolar views on this subject. Mine and Director Freeman. All right. Um, I'll share that a couple of meetings ago, I think I mentioned that I was looking forward to the next Goleta Library Advisory Commission meeting. Um, we did not have a meeting scheduled for March, so I had the schedules mixed up in my head, but we will be meeting um, on April 1st. And so I'll have something to share back. That'll be the first meeting of that commission this year. Um, and then hopefully uh, I can have more to share about what Goleta Library is hoping to do with our current service uh, there. Um, and I might have to share. Um, I'll stop there. I can't think of anything else specific at the moment. I think no other board members. I'll go to reports from standing and ad hoc committees. Director Brandt. The university negotiations ad hoc committee met and uh, had a good discussion. And I think we came away from it feeling really positive about uh, having a, a good solid plan um, we had uh, Supervisor Doss Williams there, as well as Darcel Elliott, who negotiated the original um, contribution and uh, immediately realized that that experience doesn't have a whole lot of bearing on what we're doing now because we actually have a record and things that we're doing and services. So it's much more real, not as hypothetical as kind of what they were dealing with. But I think that we have a good strategy um, and um, we are. Uh, going to uh, set up the first meeting and do a pre-meeting before that just to um, get on the same page. But we've got a good list of things. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, other standing or ad hoc committee reports, I'll go to a report from our district council. Thank you, nothing to report. All right, thank you and report from our general manager and staff. All right, well, I would say that the spring festival is pretty much consuming a ton of the time of the staff right now. So that's the majority of the report is that work is being done to get the word out to the community about safety issues, finish planning of the event. Uh, everything's going smoothly. It's mostly under budget, which is a good thing. Um, but there's uh, that's it just happens every year. We 
I don't want to say we forget it happens every year, but Delta Epi does take over at the end of March and beginning of April um, with meetings and planning and all that kind of stuff. So uh, that's the big update from staff. Uh, the Compost Collective, we're going to start our contract with Gotcha Creative next week. So we've just been doing some preparation work of how, you know, gathering data and uh, making a plan on how to work with them. Um, I shared with you all last time that we finished the photometric studies for the lighting in Isla Vista and I sent it to the board. Um, the next step we have with the County Public Works Department is to send them a list of priorities of where we'd like to see lighting based on that. And so I'm gonna, Jen has compiled that. So I'm gonna email the board for any feedback, but it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward at this point between the community feedback and the, the data. Um, there's just the clear projects there, but I wanna just send you all that heads up before we submit it to the county. Um, we have Ivy Safe coming up pretty soon, April 17th. And so we'll have a preview of the agenda at the next meeting, but, um, I think we already discussed what the upcoming agenda items were for Ivy Safe. Um, we, I also emailed the board today that the county's uh, going to be installing a landmark sign at the entrance to the community center parking lot. So it'll be, you know, a big monument that says "I love this community center," our logo on it, and that's happening next week, so April first through fourth. Hopefully, we'll not interfere with the Spring Festival, but. Uh, that's what we told them. We have a big event on the 6th. Let's please get it done before then. Um, yeah, the other thing is on the library, we've been in act, our negotiate, or not our negotiation, our library ad hoc committee has had a meeting with county staff and is working on next steps for what we're going to be doing on, um, next, on how to, we're going to approach the fiscal year planning for the county for next year uh, with our library ask. I'll just say it's gonna maybe be a longer term fix than we would like, but we'll see what's possible. That's what we know so far. Um, our finance committee needs to figure out a time to meet. It's partially on me. It's just been hard for us to get a time, but uh, hopefully next week or the week after. Uh, but I think we'll be efficient this year. So we've been doing it for so long. Um, next up is on April 2nd, if the board's interested in joining, we're gonna be canvassing. Um, every parcel in Isla Vista, but for sure the ones in Del Playa on bluff safety and Narcan distribution with supervisor caps and associate students, uh, external vice president. So please join if you're able to then. And uh, we also had a really excellent leadership meeting with IV Rec and Park District, our general manager and board president, vice president and their equivalents. Um, we discussed many different topics, including the community center parking lot, collaboration, for the festivals. Um, so we had a good meeting and we have another one on the books for April already. So we're looking forward to keeping those up. And lastly is you have five days left to turn in your form 700. And I think most of the board, including myself, haven't done that yet. So <laughs> let's do it tonight or this weekend. We won't let you down, Jonathan. Hey, I'm, I'm with you. I haven't done mine, so. <laughs> All right. And uh, did you want to mention anything about some of the issues IVRPD has run into around the social host ordinance and the? No, yes, yeah. Not, yeah, not yet. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you for that update. And now we'll move on to our next area, our closed session. Uh, we have item 6.1, um, conference with real property negotiators. If you want to ask if there's public comment, and then we can. On, oh, on. On closed session. On a closed session, thank you. Uh, is there any public comment at this time on this closed session? We do have a moment of the public. All right. I see none. Oh, uh, Director Frank. I will be recusing myself from this item due to my employment for the County Board of Supervisors. Correct. Thank you very much. So you're leaving and not coming back? How long do you think it's going to be? <laughs> it won't be a long one. Oh, okay, well, then I'll, I'll hang out because I do I want to talk to you. Okay. Okay. Well, it depends on how long we talk. <laughs> I'll, I'll go grab some food. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of hungry. Mm. Oh, Spencer, we're actually going to have to delay this because we lost four of them. 
I didn't realize. Oh. Yeah, yeah Kirsten. Uh, oh. Yeah, it's not here. So it's okay. We can take this one next week it, or next meeting. It's not a. Because we need in person quorum. We have yeah, needed in person. Even if they're noticed? Oh, interesting. Oh, are they noticed? I thought they, they are noticed. Yeah, they are noticed. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. oh, then no. We don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been through this so many times. Sorry, I thought they That's were okay. AB 2449. No, no, no. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. AB 2449. I've got it down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See Thank you. <laughs> well, there's two things we want to talk about. Um, you need to move the. Oh, yes. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What did you move? He's in the.
<laughs> he I said it. All right, we're good to go, I think, right, Jay? Yeah, we're good. We're just reporting out. All right. Um, uh, Council, can you report us out yeah. from this? Yes. Yeah. Um, so the board met in closed session pursuant to government code section 54956.8 regarding uh, 970 and 976 Embarcadero del Mar and the Pardal Solar Lot. Um, direction was given to staff, no reportable action taken. Thank you. Well done. And with that, we'll move on to our seventh item, future meeting dates and future agenda items. Are there any future agenda items that directors would like to add to our list this time? I see none, uh, so I'll read out. The next regular meeting of the board of directors will take place on uh, April, is it? Nine. Nine. April 9th, Nine. 2024 at 6 p.m. on Zoom and at the community room 970 Embarcadero, Del Mar, Isla Vista, California. And with that, I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you all. Thank you. Feeling better? Yeah, I was so laid out last time. <laughs>